Matthew 18, 1 through 6, a lesson in true greatness. This is really a sermon about humility. And I have to tell you that I'm really proud of this sermon today. <laughs> Oops. See, the thing is, some of these messages are so tough. You think it's tough sitting out there and getting your toes stepped on. Try preparing for some of these messages sometimes. Oh, my goodness. It's tough. The preparation time is a wrestling match, and this has been one of those. How do you talk about total humility when you're a minister without just getting raked over the coals a little bit? So God's been working with me in this whole thing, too. Does anybody recognize this guy right there? Richard Branson. He dabbled a little bit in a couple of small businesses, like 400 of them that the Branson Group manages. Uh, You might recognize him from Virgin Air, Virgin Records. Uh, Virgin Mobile. Richard Branson is this entrepreneur and businessman, and I remember something that just popped into my head as I was reading through the passage we're going to study in Matthew, because it really exemplifies the kind of leadership Jesus is looking for in his disciples. There's a short-lived, it may have only been for one season, uh, reality TV show a few years ago, and I caught a couple of episodes. I didn't see the whole series, but the one that really caught my eye and ear was the very first episode because Richard Branson was going to have some contestants do some crazy stuff and the winner of that season got to manage one of his companies. Not a bad thing. And the very first thing that happened was a driver met these people at the airport. They were all on the same flight. They get in this big black car and the driver had buck teeth and he had some pimples on his face. His hair was kind of long and not really well manicured or whatever you do for hair. And he was the kind of guy that would be a little bit goofy. His nose was a little bulbous, and he's the sort of fellow that you'd think, okay, you know, he's probably not the sharpest light bulb in the crayon box. Something like that. And so these people in the car, not knowing that they were on camera being filmed for the stuff, some of them would make fun of the driver. They were saying, well, Well, that guy could use some braces, you know, and all kinds of stuff like that. But some other people were really friendly to him, and they said, thank you so much for giving us a good ride. We appreciate it. They thanked him after they got out of the car. So then these people went into this really nice place where they were ushered into a lounge, and they were said, just sit here for a few minutes because Mr. Branson's going to come out and talk to you in just a few minutes. Yeah. He walks out, peeling off the mask, taking off his bulbous nose, picking off the silicone pimples from his face. And, of course, some of the people instantly, their jaws dropped and their eyes got big and they're like, oh, no. And then he got a little remote control and he points it toward the TV screen on the wall and he says, I want you to see a couple of things. You know what they were looking at. They got to see their reactions to him because they didn't know that he was Richard Branson first lesson right out of the chute was, I want everybody in my company to treat everybody in the company as though everybody should be respected. I mean, that was so good because I think this kind of humility that comes to bear when I see Jesus raising up these disciples to say, everybody is valuable. You need to treat everybody as though they are valuable. I don't care if they're the lowest man on the totem pole. You need to treat them with respect. There's something really Christ-like about the quality of offering grace to people, even if they're the kind of people that you think might not reciprocate with that same kind of grace. Pride takes something God-given and beautiful. We see this all the way back at the beginning in Genesis, and it makes it ugly. And we're going to see some contrasts today about pride and humility and the beauty that comes with being childlike in our faith. It started before the garden with Lucifer. He became prideful, wanted to have everything that God had, wanted to be like God, and of course he fell. And so then that started evil in the world. It was seen in the garden as Satan tempts Adam and Eve, starting with Eve, to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And then every person since then has had sin in their lives. Pride twists talent into tyranny. Some of the people that I've worked for that have been the most difficult bosses, now this is before I was in church work, I kind of work for God now, but (laughs) when I was doing uh, other jobs, and I worked several of them as I was going through uh, a couple of degrees, some of the bosses that I had the most difficult time with were insecure, 
and they make tyrannical bosses. And it's incredible how the pride would creep into that stuff, and they would just try to squelch everybody around them. They would try to make themselves feel bigger by making everybody else feel lower than they were. They would put them down. And it, talent, somebody may have a lot of talent, but, oh, man, if you get pride involved in that, it just becomes tyrannical in its leadership style. Have you ever noticed that there's so many talented artists that have checked out from life on this mortal coil early? You get pop stars and rock stars and artists poets, people with a real creative bent, they can be so talented. And if they don't have that focus that becomes a childlike faith like Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, bad things can happen. Pride turns purposeful productivity, which we need to have. We need to be productive. We need to have a reason to get up in the morning and think, hey, I got a to-do list. And I'm excited because when I get done with my to-do list today, I will know that I've done something to make the world a better place in which to live. We need that. But you get pride in the middle of that and it'll turn it into greedy ambition and people will step all over other people to climb their way up. Pride turns love into lust. No longer do we have intimacy as soul to soul, but now it's skin to skin and that's completely reversed from what the Bible had started to set up for us. Example that we've used before, Tony Evans, a preacher, had said this years ago and I've liked it and so I've kept using it. Fire is a good thing. We need fire, especially in Michigan in the winter. You've got to have fire. Whether it's in your furnace through a burner and then the air goes across that and heats your house, or if you have a fireplace and you can actually burn fuel like wood, fire is a good thing as long as you keep it in the fireplace. When fire gets outside of the fireplace, it's not so good anymore. It's destructive. Same thing with the parameters that God, who loves us, established for things like sex in marriage. You keep it within the parameters that God gave you for it, it's a beautiful thing. Steps outside those parameters, it's so destructive. Humility, this is a contrast here. Humility recognizes glory and wants to praise it. That's what we do when we come together and we sing songs like the ones that we've been singing together. We become humbled in our spirits, recognizing that a great God who easily could just flip us right off the earth with his little finger chose to give his own life for us, God incarnate, God the Son. And so we want to praise that. We want to exalt him. That's humility. Pride, however, sees glory and wants to possess it. We've seen that even with the mean girl syndrome. We've seen that even as as young as third or fourth grade in elementary schools where there will be some girls that will start to have a good close friend and then one of the friends wants to possess that other friendship so that they don't want their friend to have any other friends. They want to be the exclusive friend. And it wants to possess something if they see talent or if they see glory. That's what pride does. That's what happened with Lucifer. He wanted to possess everything that God was. So instead of praising glory and bowing down to God, he wanted to be God. He wanted to possess all that God possessed. So Jesus teaches something about humility and the nature of true greatness. Not the kind that the world teaches, but the kind God teaches. Starting at verse 1, chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change... Important word there. He didn't say, unless you continue to get better at doing what you've been doing. He says, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, apparently they needed to change. They weren't there yet, and so they were still buying into the mentality that leadership was tyrannical, and it had to be like the Roman government, and like the people who would lord their authority over other people. He says, unless you change and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus contrasts cultural leadership expectations with his expectations, and they're miles apart. Characteristics of a child. Why does he use a child for that? Well, children are vulnerable. I've worked for some guys that were so vulnerable in their leadership style, they 
open their hearts to the people around them, and you'd do anything for them because you recognize that they're just laying themselves bare before other people, and they said, hey, I'm a human being just like everybody else, and I still have needs, and I still have things that I need to learn from other people. I don't know it all yet. I love working for people that were vulnerable. Children are dependent, extremely dependent. You know, they they come out not able to do nothing for themselves except look cute. They had no status whatsoever. They were joyful. Children, for some reason, even people who are going through difficult times, children have the the knack and the ability to find a way to be joyful. We saw that at the Haiti Orphanage last February. The elders are going back, several of us, in March to do another round of teaching for the pastors there. These kids had nothing. I mean, compared to what we owned, they owned nothing. And they were so joyful. They grab your hand and run around. They have one little tiny car and play with it, and they just think they were the happiest person alive. Children can be joyful. So look at the one disciple who saw this example. I want us to tighten our focus because we've been looking at the Mount of Transfiguration. Before we got here, we had who were the three guys up there? Peter, James, and John. Peter is this guy. He was there. He saw this example. Let's contrast him and show what happens as he gets it. We can see the character arc, so to speak, in Peter's life. He contrasts suffering. You're going to suffer because you're of the world, or you're going to suffer because people are persecuting you. This is what he's starting to say in his letter. We're going to look at in just a second. He's saying that we should use our gifts to serve one another, and he's building up to this. This is post-resurrection, okay? I'm, I'm taking us forward in time. And then he says in 1 Peter 5.1, The elders among you, he's talking about leadership here, the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock. Can you hear the humility already? Peter is so miles apart different than he used to be as he was the open mouth every now and then just to exchange feet kind of guy to this guy who is so humble, and he's talking about humble leadership. He says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing. I've used my dad as an illustration numerous times. I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing about him, but get used to it. (laughs) Because I like talking about my dad. He was a good example. I remember being in seventh grade and driving all the way out to this tiny church west of Phoenix. I mean, it was a hole-in-the-wall place. My sister and I were looking at each other like, really? He wants to take this church? (laughs) Okay. And Dad, on the way back, was starting to say, you know, I really feel called here. I I feel like God has a place for us here. And they were salt-of-the-earth people, maybe all 25 of them. And I'm thinking, why would Dad want to drive an hour all the way out here, have to get up so early on Sunday mornings just to serve 25 people? I mean, he could get a church easily four times this size within a 10-minute drive of our house in Phoenix. But I remember him saying, these people deserve a shepherd too. He got it. He understood about this whole serve because you want to, not because you must, but because you want to. My dad had a want to kind of servant's heart. And he knew that there were certain kinds of people that nobody else was going to go and serve it. He says, well, let me then. I'll go serve them. It's a want to mentality versus a have to. How many times have we had to be chastised when God just... You know, you get those Holy Spirit moments when he whispers to you and he just takes you down a notch because you've kind of developed this, oh, I guess I have to go do this again. I'm on the the nursery rotating list. I have to serve in the nursery today because it's the third week of the month. Now, I know none of you probably get that way, but I have gotten that way in my life at times. And then the Holy Spirit just chastised me. He just sends that little arrow right into my heart. And he says, yeah, you just... Hang out with these little ones, and I'll show you what a childlike spirit is like. You need to be like one of these little ones. Want to versus a have to. And then he says, 1 Peter again, 5, this is verse 2, as God wants you to, serve as God wants you to, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Joy and I visited a person just recently, and she was having an existential crisis. She said, can we meet with you? I, I have some big questions for you. I kind of feel like maybe I have committed the unpardonable sin. I mean, she was really worried about some stuff. We spent a long time uh, listening to her and laying out some scriptures, giving her the assurance of her salvation because she had made a, a decision to follow Christ when she was a little bit younger. We wanted to go through the gospel all over again to make sure that she had it clearly in her head what the gospel was about, that it's not something you can earn. But she had gotten turned off 
because there was a pastor that she had known in a church that she had attended for a time. That pastor's in prison now because he embezzled from the church. Dishonest gain. It absolutely rocked her world, just pulled the rug right out from underneath her. And Peter knew, even back then, that there are people who are going to try to do things for dishonest gain. And he says, don't do that. Serve as an example to other people. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And I'm so grateful that I, for one, had a great example in a father who was also a minister who was an example to his flock. And so I had it both in the home and also in church. And I knew that he was the same guy both places. He wasn't two-faced. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Might have had in mind some of those Olympics back then, you know, in Greece, and they would have the laurel wreath that they would put on the winners. And those laurel wreaths don't stay very green for very long. They start to kind of fade and get wilty and get kind of brown and kind of brittle. And finally, they just kind of disintegrate. And he says, no, no, you're going to receive the kind of crown of glory that's going to go on forever. It'll never fade. He's really talking about the righteousness of Christ. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. He's quoting from Proverbs there. That's the kind of leadership he wants. That's the kind of disciples, the followers he wants. He wants people who are not going to lord it over them and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm a Christ follower, and so I know best. He wants people that are going to serve others with humility. And then in verse 6 of 1 Peter 5, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. I've used my own marriage trouble at year 16 as an example of a time when God just really humbled me big time. I had allowed several bad attitudes to creep into my life, and I thought, well, I'm doing these things for God. I'm, I'm serving the bride of Christ. And so if I ignore my wife for a time, and if I'm always gone to these meetings, she'll understand I'm doing this for God not realizing that the church had become my mistress, so to speak. And Joy and I went through a very difficult season at year 16. What I understood, though, God was trying to get me to cast all my anxiety on Him because He cared for me. He was trying to get me not to worry about everything as though it all depended on me. That's pride. I know it doesn't depend on me. I know that I can't fix every problem in the church or in the world, and there's a limit to what I can do and what I can't do. And so I had to cast my anxiety on Him because He cared for me. What do we worry about? What do we fear when it comes to our relationships? Usually it's one of two things, if you're going to boil it down quite simply. We fear hurting someone else, or we fear being hurt by someone else. Now, when I've been the most prideful, I've also been probably uh, the most fearful. And it's strange, because I'll put on this prideful facade, but inside I'm so nervous that I'm going to get hurt by somebody, and so I get protective, and I put up walls, and I react by looking through my filters, and I think that everybody somebody says about me is, I take it real personally, and I retaliate, and I get defensive. That's what happens when we fear being hurt by somebody else. But when we fear hurting somebody else, which is what I finally started to understand after I went through some counseling with my wife at year 16, I realized how much I had hurt my wife by my behavior. And I thought, I can't do that. I can't do that any longer. I I don't want to hurt my wife by the way I react to her. Every time she would come up with any kind of a suggestion, I would just bite her head off. And I would drive her into submission, into being quiet. And then I would wonder why she was so quiet. Well, it's because I was acting a certain way and I was hurting her. So when all that came out and I was starting to learn to be honest with myself, then I realized, oh, okay, instead of being hurt by her, I need to fear hurting her and I need to be aware of my behavior. That was a humbling experience for both of us, but especially for me. When I humbled myself, God lifted me up. He started to show me that when I became vulnerable before other people, they appreciated that. They wanted me to be honest about my vulnerability. When I was honest about my failings with others, even with my kids, they told me later they actually respected me more. When I could say, man, I blew that. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I get angry too, and I, I yelled, and I shouldn't have yelled. Yes, I should have disciplined, but I was over the top. Please forgive me for that. When I became vulnerable, and when I started being honest about my failings, people respected that. When I quit trying to control others and worked more on controlling myself, I was more joyful. And I recognized, you know, the Holy Spirit is working in that person's life. I can trust the Holy Spirit to keep working in them. It's taken me a long time to get where I am, and I'm not even close yet. So I think I can cut them some slack. 
when I was more childlike as opposed to childish, instead of throwing temper tantrums in retaliation to something that I felt was an offense, I laughed more often. Our family decided we needed an escape. We needed some, some, some sort of a family vacation after that big uh, 16-year marriage renewal season. And so we started saving money so we could go to Colorado. And we listened to DC talk every minute of the drive. <laughs> I can still, to this day, I can recite that whole album because we listened to it all the way to Colorado and back. We were more childlike because we were learning to start being winsome together. We were enjoying each other's company. That started to happen after I quit taking myself so doggone seriously. God doesn't humble us because he enjoys watching us grovel. He's not a meanie head who's up there looking to squish us like a bug to say, ha-ha, that made me feel better. He's trying to humble us because he wants us to be joy-filled. When we delight in him, it's because we're humble. We recognize that we're nothing and he is everything. And then the joy just starts to bubble over. Bu- 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 bubble. Bu- 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 bubble. You remember that one from way back? Jesus, the love is a bubble in no Jesus, the love of bubbles in my soul. Everybody. Okay, that was the 1970s. <laughs> Jesus wants us to be childlike and not childish. And the biggest transformation I saw in my own life in that 16-year marriage renewal is that I had to learn that I was acting childishly at times, and I needed to be childlike as Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. Let me end with this true story because it's so amazing at the childlike faith that can come out of a kid who loves Jesus and wants other people to know him that way. Tina wrote about the son Austin when he was nine and said Austin had to have his tonsils taken out. And Austin is this naturally gregarious, outgoing, will talk to anybody kind of person, kind of like Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike will talk to anybody. And so this is little Austin, nine years old. This guy comes in, he's the anesthesiologist. He's going to come in to talk to them about the options they had available and what's going to happen. And he has this really cool hat on because they have to cover their hair for sterility. And he's got little frogs on his hat. And he's talking to Austin, you know, how you doing little buddy? And he goes, I'm okay, I'm good. And he told him, he said, you're going to get two choices here. You can either, I can have you get the IV now and we can give you a little happy stuff that's going to make you feel a little bit loopy and and fun. And then we'll wheel you up to the operating room and then we're going to give you the mask and then we'll put you to sleep for a while. And when you wake up, it's all going to be over. Or we can get you up to the operating room first and then we can give you the happy gas. And when you get the goofy gas, you're going to feel more relaxed and then we can put in the IV. Which would you choose at nine years old? He said, give me the gas. Yeah, he wanted the happy gas so that he would feel more relaxed before they poked him. And so as the anesthesiologist was leaving the room, he goes, oh, wait a minute. He goes, yeah, buddy. He says, do you go to church? The guy goes, well, no. It's something I probably should be doing, but no, I I don't go to church. He goes, oh, okay. Well, are you saved? He goes, To be honest, no, but it's something that maybe I should consider. And he goes, oh, I think you should because Jesus is great. And the guy said, well, thanks, little buddy. I'll I'll see you up there. So then they get him up into the operating room. And then the anesthesiologist starts to put the mask over Austin's little face. And Austin, you know, pushes it away and says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, what? He goes, we got to pray. So the anesthesiologist says, well, okay, go ahead. And Austin said, dear Jesus. Help the doctors and nurses to have a good day. And I really hope that the guy with the the frog hat will come to know you and and so he can be saved and go to church. Amen. He goes, okay. (laughs) Fast forward past the operation. The anesthesiologist comes down into the recovery area and walks in to see Tina there and says, "Uh, I don't normally come down after the surgeries. The doctor will do that, but the anesthesiologists normally don't do that. But I had to come tell you what a great kid you've got. She says, I have to tell you something that happened in the OR. She goes, oh boy. (laughs) What did that little rascal do now? He goes, no, it was a good thing. And he told Tina about what he had said. 
and about the prayer that he had said. He said, man, I thought he was going to pray, you know, for the operation and for there not to be any pain or something. He said, he prayed for me. He said, that just amazed me. He said, you've got some kind of kid there. And she says, well, thank you. And he walked away. A few minutes later, a nurse came to escort her to the next place because they were doing a little step-up thing. And they were walking to the elevator, and the nurse says, I just have to tell you a little something. And she goes, I think I know. And she told him the story. And she goes, no, no, there's more. She said, really? She said, yeah, several of us nurses have been witnessing to and praying for that anesthesiologist for months. And after the operation, he came to us in the lounge, and he said, okay, girls, you got me. If this little boy can pray for me just before he goes into surgery, I need your Jesus. And we prayed together, and he received Jesus Christ right there in the lounge. Wow. Is that incredible or what? That's childlike faith. He was winsome. He had no status whatsoever, and God used him in such a powerful way. Just think what God could do with a whole congregation full of people multiple congregations full of people with that kind of childlike faith and love for Jesus and love for other people. Don't you want to be a part of that? Let's pray together. God, I'm so grateful for your word, for people like Peter, who started out one way and ended up another, for people like Austin, who had such a childlike faith, for people like us, who still have a long way to go, but we're taking steps in the right direction because we're facing in your direction and we're trying to get to know you better as you reveal yourself to us more and more and more through your word. And I pray that we'll be that kind of winsome, childlike disciple, not lording leadership over other people, but serving them in love, not because we have to, but because we want to, because we understand that we're really just serving Jesus Christ. You're the one that we're trying to please, regardless of how other people treat us in return. So now I pray that as we leave this place, we're going to be so joy-filled because we're so childlike. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.